Ladies and gentlemen, internet, my name is Pridium and I've been moved. Truth be told, I'm not one to normally move very much, chained to a desk, pumping out survivor videos like a digital Sisyphus, but no really, sometimes it's nice to be reminded of the power that this show can have, the light it can shed, the bonds it can forge. After all, Survivor initially began not just as a game, but more so as a social experiment, bringing together all walks of life across the country to huddle together in a sunken sand pit of a shelter in some remote location in the world, attempting to build a new world with its own set of rules. This experiment tested the waters of adaptation, of setting aside differences to find common ground all within the confines of a structured show built around a game. In this video, I want to talk about some of the most powerful moments throughout the history of the show. Moments that occasionally transcend the show, but for the most part exist not in spite of it, but because of it. Moments that have had an impact either broadly speaking on the wider viewing public, or much more personally, that resonated with me and maybe a few of you out there. This video is not going to be a ranking, it's just a series of powerful moments to remember. And before I hear about it, I just want to say I can't show every moment in their entirety due to copyright, so pipe down Linda. This is their story. This is Survivor. When it comes to memorability, it's hard to pass on the very first post-marooning scene of the very first episode of the very first season. When Tagi hit the beach in Borneo and were introduced for the very first time to a merry band of misfits from all around the country who have no idea what kind of journey they're about to embark upon. The moment I'm really talking about is the interaction between Richard Hatch and Sue Hawk, two very different humans, one corporate, the other country, attempting to work together out of the gate when they first hit the beach, and clearly they are having a communication breakdown. Mark Burnett has stated that this scene is Survivor in a nutshell. Rich is trying to organize the group to move together as one unit, and Sue is as well, but how they approach this objective and choose to go about it is very different. Rich wants to assess and have a group discussion about the why. Why are we here? And what are we really doing? And Sue wants to talk less and have more action, more moving parts. They'll figure it out as they go. So right out of the gate, the question then becomes, is one of these approaches better than the other? Can these two people with their differences, can these differences coexist, survive, and maybe even thrive? This is but one example of that whole different walks of life mantra that we hear about, but you know, it's so true. Hundreds of millions of people coexist in this country alone, all of us different from one another, but in the pursuit of a common goal, can we work together or will we fall apart? What do you think we're doing now? Not functioning together at all. I'm a redneck and I don't know corporate world at all. And corporate world ain't gonna work out here in the push. By that same token, let's talk about preconceived notions, about stereotypes and judging others at face value. In the same season, Survivor Borneo, we had Rudy, a 72 year old Navy SEAL who was from an older generation with a different set of ideals. Being thrown into a world of mostly 20 and 30 year olds all watching MTV or whatever, it'd be easy to see him get stuck in his ways, to not adapt to the social climate or the culture or challenge himself to change his opinions and beliefs. Paddling over, uh, we had two or three of those boxes in the water, dragging them behind the, the raft, and that is dumb. I said, let's get them boxes aboard. It'll be a lot easier. You know, that, that's dead weight you got. The hardest part is hanging around with all these young kids. And I'm used to being in the military, and one guy stands up and he gives an order, and there's no back talk. They're not going to do that. I got to fit in, not them. You know, there's more of them than there is of me. Yet, right after the marooning in episode one, Rudy tells us, he began to change his preconceived notions right away. Before we got on the island here, I formed opinions about people, but I changed my mind just on that trip in. It's rich, for one. I mean, this guy is, he's strong, he's smart. The guy surprises me. You know, he's fat, but he's, <laughs> he's good. While this dynamic between these two players is now decades old, the underlying sentiment is still alive and it's kicking today. And to see it so stark in that first season, in the first episode, 
The friendship that formed between the two of them, in spite of what Rudy believed about Rich, about his opinions on being gay, about being friends with somebody who was gay. Rudy came to respect Rich's character and cast aside his preconceived judgment in favor of judging his actions and words and character. You know, the actual person. If he knew I were gay, that would be probably really difficult for him, I think. 72 years old, Navy vet, I think it would just freak him. And I think he feels comfortable talking to me. I'm certainly comfortable talking to him. He's one of the nicest guys I ever met. And he's good at what he does, you know? He's got leadership ability. And, and if these people here would listen to him, he, he would take him a long way. But anyway, uh, me and Richard got to be pretty good friends. Not in a homosexual way, that's for sure. Now, removing the person from the picture with my next moment in this video, it has to be said that Survivor became real, not just a silly political game, but a real one with a physical toll when Michael Scoopin fell in the fire in season two, The Australian Outback. Look, I know we got our opinions regardless of who it was that fell or how you feel about them now, just the sheer severity of this injury being the first medical evacuation, this was unprecedented and entirely unexpected at the time that it happened. It's also probably the most gruesome, just the image of the skin on his hands. <sighs> this moment is here for obviously entirely different reasons than the previous ones I've just talked about, but you know, it's still a really powerful, unforgettable moment. It was the moment that Survivor went to another level, and if there's anything I have learned from this, it's that I should pay more attention to what Smokey the Bear has to say about fire safety. In a similar vein, I also want to bring up a more modern variant on this moment, one that appeared as utter chaos. I think the worst medical evacuation in Survivor history. It's Caleb Reynolds from Survivor Co. Wrong, season 32, in the fourth episode when he collapsed due to heat exhaustion alongside two other players in Sydney and Debbie. Three people collapsed in the middle of a challenge, a reward challenge for salt and pepper, due to extreme heat. And in the case of Caleb, he had to be taken to the nearest hospital via emergency helicopter. This is one of the most panic-induced moments in Survivor, and in case anyone forgot the show was still real, here you go. Watching the producers scramble, it's, it's very rare that we get to see shots of production, the production crew behind the scenes, but this moment broke the fourth wall because the emergency demanded it so. And watching Caleb's tribe weep for him before he flew off was, it was heartbreaking. All right, let's go, we need water, water, water. What's your back, what's your You're back? all right, Caleb. We're right here, all right? Medical's with us. Let's go, put some on him. Back out. Right, everybody on the crew is essential personnel. Okay, let me stay with this. Umbrellas, Caleb. coolers, water. Right. Find a spot yep. to help. End of a given second. Thank you, sir. Caleb, you know there's only two ways you leave this game other than being voted out, and that's quitting, which you clearly are not doing. This is as far as you're going to go. We've got to take care of you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Speaking of breaking hearts, we're only getting started guys, <laughs> don't you worry. I want to spend a moment to yin and yang between two variations of players who basically quit the show on completely different terms. The first is Jenna Maraska from Survivor All Stars on day 9 when she voluntarily chose to leave the game because she was feeling conflicted about being there in the first place and it was time to act. Before Jenna went on to the All-Star season, her mother was not doing well. She had a form of cancer and was in a rehabilitation home. And some may say, or at least I have heard some say, that maybe Jenna shouldn't have gone on the season in the first place. But you know what? <sighs> it needs to be said that cancer patients oftentimes have cancer for many, many years. Heck, Jenna's mother wasn't well when Jenna was crowned sole survivor two seasons prior. I have to imagine her mom did not want her to miss out on her behalf. You can't put your life on hold and live in constant fear, especially when you've already spent many years changing short and long-term plans based around the sickness. Jenna quit on day nine, and it turned out her mother passed away only eight days later. To me, it's one of the saddest moments in the history of the show, just that black screen with text at the end of the episode giving us all an update. Due to someone who's very ill at home right now, that's getting 
worse. I need to pull myself out of the game. I got a feeling that she needs me there. My dad needs me there. Everybody needs me there. I feel really bad for her. Can I give her a hug? Of course. On the flip side, however, you get a powerful moment of what happens when someone that probably should never have been cast in the first place with Brandon Hance from Survivor Kara Moen. Now, this moment is powerful, at least to me, for very different reasons, particularly in that Brandon had to impromptu be voted out at an immunity challenge after his tribe agreed to throw it to get him out of the game. But they did that for his own sake, because he was slowly spiraling out of control, losing his temper, breaking things, pouring out the rice and food supply, threatening violence, and just being a hazard to everyone around him. Brandon didn't really seem to mind the instant vote out while Jeff was massaging his shoulders to calm him down. I think Brandon expected it and was at peace with this notion. This moment is something else. It's ugly. And for many, it's not enjoyable to watch. But that's why it's here. I don't know if Brandon was in the right state of mind to be on the show in the first place, let alone coexisting with Philip Shepard, but at least in the end, nobody got hurt. I've calloused myself to people who really don't give it. They don't care about anybody but their self. That's pathetic, and you're going nowhere with that attitude. We're all out here to play a game, and we've been doing so well, and we had great unity, and to see two people fight and say really cruel things to each other, I really... You are That's one pathetic thought. individual. You're pathetic. You're you are pathetic. Hey, shut your no. mouth. You shut can't your shut mouth. shut my mouth. I'm tired of you talking. You've been talking. Don't walk this way. way. Here's Dang. what's going to happen. I love you, but I know you're fired up. You don't want me going back. Uh, you're not going back to camp, no. Thank you. This is over. But now, let's turn to Modern Survivor. I don't know if it's pure coincidence or what, but the past several seasons have really had some strong, impacting moments, at least for one fan. Another yin and yang, two for the price of one, we have Zeke, the millennial from Millennials vs. Generation X. As forced as that theme was, I gotta admit, his sit down with Brett, a Gen Xer, where they bonded over being gay, really was something else. Similar to the generational divide with Rich and Rudy back in season one, in the case of Zeke and Brett, we had two generations coming together and sharing common ground, but bonding over being quite similar to one another instead of different. It was the timing of the generations that made them different in how they grew up and how they live right now. I thought that that was really touching. I've lived with not saying anything, so for me to come out here and not say anything, I just, it's life. I've lived like that. He spent time in the military during the Don't Ask, Don't Tell era where he couldn't have been in the military if he told people he was gay. And I'm excited that now Brett is getting a chance to like reap the rewards of what he has sowed. However, on the flip side, the yang to this yin, we have Zeke, the same guy, back for the next season in Game Changers, where he was outed to the rest of his tribe by Jeff Varner in a desperate last attempt from Varner to try to throw Zeke under the bus and paint him as untrustworthy. Zeke was a transgender person and Varner picked up on that and because Varner was going to get voted out that night, he thought there was some connective tissue between Zeke being capable of not telling anyone about this fact and what he would be capable of in the game. It was a terrible argument that led the tribe to unanimously vote Varner out without even putting pen to parchment. But in spite of the poor remarks that Varner made, in their wake there shined a light not just on Zeke and how steadfast he stood in the face of adversity, but on the rest of the tribe too for rallying behind Zeke in the blink of an eye. This moment harkened back to the original premise of this social experiment, and it was a truly gripping moment for everyone involved, viewers included. I personally don't have any exposure to transgender people, but I don't think it would affect me or change my opinion on someone in the slightest, and it was really cool amongst an assortment of different people to see how normal it was without a second thought. And that Zeke, above all, took it in stride. Conversely, it also showed us how far someone may go, how low they may stoop to stay in the game. This moment was both incredibly dark and uplifting. 
and its footprint will be remembered through the annals of Survivor history. Why haven't you told anyone you're transgender? What I'm showing is a deception. But that's it's personal. Not, it, that, it has it's nothing to do with the game. It's not personal. personal. You didn't have so to do listen. that. That is so wrong we for are you on. to bring that out. You're saying by him not revealing it that he's capable of deception. That is a giant leap of logic. And just to see someone out someone else is pretty painful, but I, I understand that Jeff is feeling very on the outs. It's just, I feel, I really feel for Zeke. You know, it's his right to tell people. There's a great kicker to this. I really liked Varner. I thought we like, you know, connected over the past couple days. We shared a lot of stories. He shared a lot about his life. And it's been tearing me up that I have to vote this guy out. So you know what? Varner was really not cool, but like, you know, I'm fine. I'm certainly not anyone who should be a role model for anybody else, but maybe there's someone who's a Survivor fan and me being out on the show helps him or helps her or helps someone else. And so maybe this will lead to a greater good. Now I have two more moments I want to talk about, the first being a rather quick moment from a pre-merge episode that particularly stood out to me enough to leave an impression upon me even when <laughs> I can't entirely relate to it. It's from Survivor Heroes Healers Hustlers. It's Ben, the former Marine, who had a moment where he had a strong reaction to the bamboo in the camp cracking and exploding due to an increase in temperature. I didn't really know this, but when that happens, it makes a really loud exploding noise, and because of how sudden it was, Ben reacted to it, almost like it was a gunshot. It freaked him out, and he had to distance himself from the rest of the tribe to kind of shake it off, get those monkeys off his back, so to speak. Ben does a fantastic job of explaining this moment to those of us out there who don't fully understand where he's coming from, and that, yeah, within the context of Survivor, you're trying to win a million dollars, but in many ways, there is a bigger picture, too. Oh, damn it. Oh, my lord. Oh, man. Bastard. I'm just gonna... Oh, you got him hitting. Sorry, Ben. Other people, civilians or whatever, have no idea what it's like to, uh, to be shot at or more... Well, have people try to kill you. You can't comprehend that without being there and going through it. And so those reactions are 100% real for men and women that have fought for our country. And it's hard to be around other people that don't understand that. Before I met my wife, that was a monkey on my back. And my wife and kids have definitely saved me from my demons, my nightmares, and the past. I used to live in the past. That's not a good thing for anyone. You gotta look forward to the future, because the past will eat you alive, but the future will save you. You know, winning the million for my family is, is my goal, but there's a bigger picture, and it's bigger than me, my family, the game of Survivor. It's about just being able to show vets who have gone through battle and war and depression and PTSD there's a way to life outside of all that hell. Lastly, I want to wrap up this tissue-filled heartbreak of a walk down memory lane with perhaps the most impactful moment for me in nearly 40 seasons of the show. In fact, a while ago, over a year ago now, I almost made a video outright about just this moment with no real aim or direction, just kind of rambling. Why not? But I do think that this particular subject on this particular day will suffice too. The moment was Adam Klein, and it wasn't so much just how touching his story was throughout season 33, Millennials vs. Generation X. It was how real it became at the end of it, after the glow of the edit went away and we were able to really meet Adam live at the reunion on our TV screens after he has been awarded the title of Soul Survivor. What I mean by that is, I always liked Adam in that season. I think he's probably the quintessential Survivor superfan whose dream became incredibly real. Incredibly real. So Adam, let's talk about this <laughs> look on your face. We haven't even started. First of all, this place is unbelievable. It's beautiful. I feel like I'm inside my television right now. I mean, he was already a super fan like many of us, like myself, but then he got to go on the show. And then he not only got on the show, he went on to win. 
That's what most of us dream about. And he had a touching, heartfelt, real, raw, heartbreaking story all season involving why he was on the show in the first place, the motivation that kept him pushing ahead episode after episode. It was because his mother was sick with cancer, she wasn't doing great and he knew this and he chose to go on Survivor anyway, similar to Jenna Maraska that I spoke about earlier. He chose to go out on her behalf, on both their behalves. Because like I said, you, you can't put your life on hold forever and when opportunity knocks, especially when it's perhaps the strongest, tangible thing between you and the person that you're caring for, you answer that call. Adam tried to get on Blood vs. Water season 27 with his mom and it didn't work out. Six seasons later and his mom was still there and he was given a second chance to realize their dream that couldn't be fulfilled back then. And he took it. Mom, this is for you. I love you so much. It was really tough to make the decision to come out here. My mom was diagnosed about seven months ago with stage four lung cancer. It's such a devastating disease. <laughs> it's been such a nightmare. <laughs> it's been the worst thing you could possibly imagine. And so to have like my biggest dreams coming true at the same time that my worst nightmare is happening, it's 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 so it's just not it doesn't feel real. <laughs> My mom is a huge super fan. She's the ultimate reason for being here. I want to give my mom something to look forward to. Being able to watch me find this, that's what I came out here to do, is bring some joy back to my family. And he had a hell of a time, and I actually haven't talked about him much on my channel, but I do know that one of the times I did highlight him in one of my videos, it wasn't for the best of reasons, but, I did mean well, and I've wanted to express those sentiments for a while. Fun fact, he was the first Survivor player and winner to sub to my channel. Also Will Wall, back when I was able to keep track of those smaller details. At first Adam found that idol in that clamshell and it was a funny, touching moment. And then he had that scene with Jay and the reward steal and the hammock. The guys shared their stories with each other, they bonded over a lot of things, and through it all, they gained a sense of mutual understanding and respect. That kind of stuff, the respect, is what allowed Adam to sweep the jury. And he even was given a chance at the very end of the final tribal to open up to the rest of the cast about his unfortunate circumstances. The big meaty why in why he's out here playing Survivor in the first place. And yeah, he exposed his pain, tremendously so, in those final moments before the game wrapped up and the jury voted. And whether it was strategy or not, Mate, it was heartbreaking to watch. And every time I found an idol, and when I won immunity, and especially when I got the loved ones visit, I felt like we were winning together. And so that's what this journey was about for me. But for me, what really struck me, what stood out to me and had me include all of this writing, all of this preamble to get to where my point is trying to go, all this talking in this video at the very end of it, what got to me was the live reunion after he won. It was when he provided an update about the situation that he was in with his late mother, how she passed away not long after he got back to the States from filming and was able to tell her in her final moments that he won the game. Watching Adam on live national television, for me, was something else. And he knew that it was something else. He knew that this story of his was a lot to bear for a lot of people, and even though he's a super duper fan of the show, and he knows what it means to so many people to be in his position that he was in right there, sitting in the front row, furthest to the left seat at the live union, he knows how touching this story is, how sad it is. But in the end, <sighs> It's not a story to him. It's an unfortunate reality. Very rarely in the history of the show does Survivor broadcast such profoundly unfortunate realities. The most bittersweet of them all. This is probably the top of everything emotional for me when it comes to this show because when I watched it, I was reminded that personally, I will never get to meet my own mother-in-law, the most impacting and important person in my wife's life as she passed away due to cancer a year before I ever got to meet my wife. And I've heard the unfortunate stories and I've seen the overwhelming hurt of loss and just seeing Adam 
reminded me of the most unfortunate part of my life, which <laughs> it sounds kind of bad when you put it in that sentence, but it's actually the most fortunate I have ever felt while watching the show. It was a gift for me, and it was probably the most powerful moment in Survivor in my personal book. You know, my mom had two days before, during final tribal council probably, my mom was walking around the block, and she was thriving still. And I got home, and I was able to tell her, I said, Mom, I love you so much. And she was there with me. She was not on board feeder. And she said, I love you. And she said, and I said, I love you. I love you. She said, don't stop saying that. I said, I love you. I love you. My dad and my brother were all saying it. <laughs> she died an hour after I got home. I told her I won. Do you think she heard you? <laughs> it doesn't matter because she knew. That's yeah. what moms do. You, she, she knew. Yeah. <laughs> she absolutely knew. That's awesome. So, that is where I'm at. 3,188 words later and a box of tissues. Let's pull ourselves back together. Let me know, right now, what are some of the most powerful, impacting moments from Survivor that left an impression on you? There's a lot that I haven't talked about, so give it to me. And after all is said and done, my name is still pretty. I'm saying, like always, thank you for watching. Motivating me to keep pushing that ball up that hill. Don't forget to soak it all in at the top when you're on your way out. And I will see you in the next one once I go hug a pillow or something. Where's my woobie? Where, where did I put my woobie? My name is Adam Klein. I'm 25 years old. I'm from San Francisco, California, and I do strategic planning for a large homeless shelter nonprofit. I want to be able to sit at the finale, get those votes, you know, win the million dollars, and hand the check to my mom in the audience. Like, that's the dream. The winner of Survivor Millennials versus Gen X. Just really quickly, uh, the, uh, the, the poll that you saw the, uh, the, the people take, and they talked about who ought to win, and they picked Rudy. And uh, uh, Kelly and I had a chance to, to be there at the end and close the camp. And these were a couple of things that were left in camp that I think Marge and Rudy would like. And one is the sign that said, Rowdy Rudy's Diner, and I want Marge to have it. And the other is the clue that we got for the immunity challenge that Rudy won. Rudy, I'm going to end with you again because uh, I'm familiar with some tough comments you had. Don't call me, I won't call you. These are not people I'd pick as friends. Change your mind? Uh, not really. I like <laughs> <laughs> and he means that in a really kind way.